and you will live. That's what the scripture says. It's wise to listen to the prophets. And we've heard a lot of prophets, a lot of prophetic words about Passover to Pentecost. And at this filming, we have just come out of Pentecost. And so we want to look at this. We want to look at Pentecost and what it means and what it means after Pentecost. That's like saying, what does it mean after revival? No one wants to think about after revival. They want to think about revival and they want to think about the fun and the, the, the goosebumps and the manifestations and the, the gold in the air. But what happens after the revival? So we know that there were three main feasts in Israel, the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. So we see fulfillment, of course, from the Old Testament fulfilled in the New Testament. So the personal fulfillment of Passover is the Passover lamb that was slain for us and we were saved uh, and we, we come to know Jesus as our Lord. And, and then the, the Feast of Pentecost is when what? The Holy Spirit came in, when power came in. Stay here and you will receive power from on high. So personally, we receive the, the, the second feast in our lives, the Feast of Pentecost, when we receive the baptism, the fulfillment of the Holy Spirit inside of us. We had Holy Spirit when Jesus came and brought power, but, but this is a baptism. And there was a difference in the early church because the early church, they were, they were seeing miracles. Uh, Jesus was doing miracles, blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> there, were, there were miracles everywhere, but then he said, now you're going to receive power. So this, this little fledgling church with these, these, regular, these regular people that were tax collectors and, and uh, fishermen and all this, they needed power because Jesus was about to go and they needed another comforter. So when power came, when Pentecost came, even during that day of Pentecost, Peter began to, to teach because they had this experience. Now, what do we do with this experience? And so Jesus, Jesus had given Peter wisdom to say, okay, Acts 2, 22, you men of Israel, he said, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man accredited and pointed out and shown forth and commended and attested to, to you by God, by his mighty works and the power of performing wonders and signs as you yourselves know. So there's Peter's saying, now listen, this was what Jesus did and this was who he was. And so then in Acts 2.36, he goes on to say, therefore let the whole house of Israel recognize beyond all doubt and acknowledge assuredly that God has made him both Lord and Christ the Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. So he's already explaining the transition of Jesus, the breakthrough of power that came into the earth, gentle as a little baby, but came into the earth and brought power and then brought after him Holy Spirit, who was another one like Jesus with power. So they had to learn what's going on. And so that very day after Peter told all this long thing, you should look at all of the, of the, the, the whole book of Acts chapter 2. But as he got through, 3,000 souls were added that day to the kingdom. So you know, of Jesus, they said, you know, the beginning of his signs, Jesus' signs, was water into wine. And it said he manifested his glory. So all of a sudden through Jesus and then by, empowered by the Holy Spirit, we are learning with the disciples in the early church what really was the glory, what was the glory of the Lord. And then through Holy Spirit, what was the source of this power that Jesus had? 
Now, in, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for glory is kabod, which means weight. Uh, there's a heaviness, a weight. Some of you have experienced this when you're touched by the Holy Spirit in a service or, or, or somewhere even by yourself, and you just your, your body begins to feel heavy. You may even fall because your, your, your carnal flesh can't handle that supernatural weight of glory. So 2 Corinthians 4.17 teaches us about this glory. He says, for our light momentary affliction, this slight distress of the passing hour. Now, the church then, that wasn't slight. And distressing is not a strong enough word for what they were going through. <laughs> but he's saying in the scheme of eternity, this slight momentary affliction. So you and I, as terrible as, as the times are right now, and, and our heart really goes out to all of you in the different nations and all of us in the United States that are, that are experiencing severe problems and losing members, family members to death. Our heart goes out to you because it is an affliction and it is a terrible, terrible time. But it says in this scripture that it is more and more abundantly preparing and producing and achieving for us an everlasting weight of glory. And that phrase in the original language means beyond all measure, surpassing all comparisons of vast and transcendent glory and blessedness never to cease. So we have to look not at the things which we see, not at these terrible things, that we're experiencing. But this is a teaching of us, just as we'll see about the early church. It's teaching us to press through this and look at the things which are not seen, which is that eternal weight of glory, letting that glory rest in us, body, soul, and spirit. In our next two teaching sessions, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about this whole process so, the, so the, the early church, I mean, Jesus gave it to them. Jesus gave it to the church. Matthew 10, 1 said when he called his disciples together, he gave them power. Now, this was Jesus gave them power, his power that became their power over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sicknesses and diseases. This is a part of the power and the glory of Christ. Christ came manifested his glory through all of these signs. That's what Peter was saying. He did all of these signs, and he was manifesting his glory. He was manifesting this very power that he gave to the church. In John 17, he, he's, Jesus is talking to the Father. He said, I gave my glory. I gave them my glory. You gave it to me, and I gave it to them. I gave them my glory. So after Pentecost, the disciples were faced with this massive challenge. They were experiencing a new era. They were experiencing a new way of life. They were, they were experiencing good things, but there was opposition. So we're going to talk about that in the next teaching, War Against Pentecost. So they had massive opposition, but Acts 2.43, a sense of awe, reverential fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were performed through the apostles, and all who believed, now the word believed there is who adhered to, trusted in, and relied on Jesus Christ. All who did that were united, and together they had everything in common. And so we have to learn even today, I've been saved all my life. I've been filled with the Spirit for 35 years. Years, I don't mention years. <laughs> I've been, I, I received it when I was five, right? <laughs> so we, I've, I've experienced all of this, and I still have to remind myself when I see terrible things all around me, I still have to remind myself to adhere to and trust in and rely on Jesus, to adhere and trust in and release Holy Spirit. So the early church, after Pentecost, they had glory, they had signs and wonders, and they had persecution. 
and opposition. There was opposition. So, you know, I've, I've had many experiences with the power of the Holy Spirit that, that these disciples were learning to use and learning this new era. It's a new era. It's a new, it's a new way in the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus was teaching them to move in power. And then the disciples with the Holy Spirit had to learn even more how to move in power because the, whole, the, the disciples, they would go to new areas and, and these people, they would say, have you received the Holy Spirit since you were saved? So they would go to Christians and then it says they would lay their hands on them and they would receive the Holy Spirit. So they were going and they were empowering, empowering, empowering leading to Christ and then empowering with the Holy Spirit because the early church was establishing the kingdom for all time. It was, it was the establishment. They had to have power. You and I in this time, we have to have power. We cannot face each day. Now at the filming of this, we're still in quarantine. We've, we, we can't go anywhere much. We can't do much. If we go, we, we're, we're, we're separated from one another by masks and so forth and distancing one from another. And we have to have power to overcome this. My husband and I were, were uh, in an accident three weeks after we were married. And I was burned very severely and had many surgeries. I had to wear a burn mask for a year and a half, 24 hours a day. And so this burn mask covered up my whole face that I used to communicate with, just holes for the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. And I had to, I had to see that I was not my outward person. I was the person on the inside. You and I, we have to learn we're the, who we are is on the inside. This is just our, this is just our clothes. This flesh, this is just my clothes. This is just my earth suit. This is just what I wear when I'm here. But what I have on the inside, my spirit is united with Christ. And, and, and so who I am had to come out. Who I am had to communicate past this barrier, this mask. And so it's the same principle with the tough times. We have to communicate. We have to move. We have to press through the times in which we live just like the disciples. So the disciples asked Jesus, you know, they tried to cast out devils and they, they wouldn't go. <laughs> and so they said, why can't we cast them out? So in Matthew 17, 20, Jesus said, because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. And so that's where we are, right where the disciples were then, both before Pentecost and then after Pentecost. They had to have the faith that's given, everyone is given the measure of faith. They had to have the faith to work miracles. Now, I was in a, a church uh, in the United States many years ago, and we were, in, we were prophesying. We, there were three of us. We were prophets. We were prophesying. We had three long lines and... And so uh, I had a, actually a friend in this other state uh, that had sent a friend of hers, and she came to my line. And so the minute I got to her, not I didn't know who she was. The minute I got to her, I said a couple of words, and she fell on the floor and began to shriek. And she was, she was obviously under the influence of demonic powers. And so I began to, to minister to that and to bind the, the enemy and to cast the devil out and to and and word of knowledge word of knowledge over and over and over you you felt this but this is not true and you felt this but this is not true and, and suddenly she sat up like a different person and her whole face was different and she said how did you know those things about me well it wasn't me it was the holy spirit that's what i'm telling you it's what's inside that counts it's who is inside of us that counts and so we simply release the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is within you. Jesus is in you. Christ, the hope of glory. The, the, the Holy Spirit 
is in us and we pour him out, it says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. So Jesus said, just let that flow out of you. It'll be a living, alive water. And so the church then was beginning more and more expanding everywhere, beginning and fulfilling prophecy. That's another thing that was said in Acts 2. He said in, in the beginning, and he tells what the prophet Joel said, it shall come to pass that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. And that, that Hebrew word means telling forth the divine counsels. And your young men will see visions. That word means divinely granted appearances. And your old men shall dream dreams. That word means divinely suggested dreams from the Lord. This is what was happening and what, was, what Peter was warning the disciples and the new converts and new believers. He was warning them. This was prophesied back then and now is the day that it's being fulfilled. So they lived the supernatural and joy was their strength. It's just amazing. Joy was their strength. So Acts 2 they, they're, he's continuing, he says, Now David, the prophet David, he said, I saw the Lord constantly before him that I may not be shaken or overthrown or cast down from my secure and happy state. This is the Amplified Bible. Now, he's talking about, he, David had to, even back then, without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, he had to talk to himself. He had to say, my soul, why are you cast down within me? You and I, we need to fight depression. We need to fight oppression. We need to fight all that's coming against us in this odd and unprecedented time. We have to say, I see him constantly. I look at him constantly. I say, God, you are ever with me. You are ever before me. And you are in me. And I will not be shaken. I will not be overthrown. I will not be cast down. So verse 26, therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue, our words, my tongue exulted exceedingly. We sing the songs of the Spirit. We sing the songs of praise and of worship. And we, enc we encourage ourselves in the Lord. After, David after David's son died, the Bible says he encouraged himself in the Lord. David was a man after, his, after God's own heart. And so you and I, we've got to encourage ourselves in the Lord. And Peter was reminding them of all of these prophecies so that they would know this is how we live. This is how we're going to live from now on. This is the new era. This is the new time in our lives. And we're going to operate differently. You and I, we've got to operate differently. Then Psalm, uh, verse 27, you will not abandon my soul. There are people today, you know, they're seeing all these terrible things and they're saying, why is God doing this? That's one of the reason, things they say. Or they say, why have you abandoned me? Well, God hasn't abandoned us. The Bible says he will never leave us or forsake us. I am telling you today, if you feel abandoned, that's your soul in you. We're going to talk about that in one of the next teachings. That's your soul. That's your mind and your emotions. We put the Lord before us. We exalt in the Lord. And then he causes truth in the innermost being to come out. And then we can rejoice in him. Verse 28, Acts 2, verse 28. You've made known to me the ways of life. See, this, the ways of life haven't changed. Now, we're fighting an unprecedented enemy here. All over the world, in every country in the world, we're fighting an unprecedented problem. But the ways of life have not changed. God doesn't change. The ways of life haven't changed. So we go back to the Lord. We get up, we're discouraged, we're frightened, we're fearful, we're overwhelmed. We go to the Lord. We don't run away from him because that's where all that stuff lives. <laughs> he didn't give us a spirit of fear. So we go to the Lord and he says, oh, I just love this. You will enrapture me, diffusing my soul with joy with and in your presence. 
Now, the, the, that's Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11, if you're looking in the Old Testament. But here they're reminding us what the prophet said. He will enrapture us. It doesn't depend on circumstances. It doesn't depend on if we're about to be thrown to the lions like the, like the, the, the new church or, or, or we're being thrown in prison like Paul. It, it doesn't, the circumstances don't matter. We sing praises like they did in, in prison and the, and the prison doors were shaken and they were released. We are enraptured in him. In the world, we have fear, we have apprehension, and it's not good. So after Pentecost, there were miracles and glory in the midst. And yet, Paul said, rejoice always. Rejoice always. Again, I say, rejoice. So the hands of the apostles went out. And Acts 5, 12, the hands of the apostles, startling signs and wonders. It became a way of life. They learned the ways of life. <laughs> you and I need to use all this as an excuse to learn the ways of life. Where do we live? Where do we live? Are we living in the circumstances or are we living in the kingdom where he enraptures us? Even the shadows of the disciples, would, people would get healed because they were so infused with the Holy Spirit. After Pentecost, they were infused with the Holy Spirit. They were so infused and they lived it every day, every day, every day, that when they would walk by people who were ill, it said, five, Acts 5, 16, they gathered and came so that they would, they would be cured. And, and Acts 5, 15, it says they kept carrying them into the streets, hoping that Peter would pass by because he was so infused with the Holy Spirit. You and I have to be infused with the Holy Spirit. Many years ago, back when I was younger and I was actually dancing some, you know, we body, soul, and spirit, the whole thing. And um, a, a famous prophet that you all know and love uh, asked me to come and do this, 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 this conference in uh, Washington, D.C. And so we all got in this hotel, and so I got this note in my mailbox from her saying, tomorrow at the service I want you to do a healing dance. Well, I had no idea what she was talking about. I said, healing dance? I'm not doing a healing dance. I don't have any, any, I don't know how to make any movements. I don't know what that means. And so I waited. I put it off. I didn't want to answer it. I waited and I waited and I waited. And finally the Lord said, you're going to do it. And I went, oh, no. And so I sent her a note back. I said, I will do it. So she had this woman who was fabulous on the piano. She said, okay, now she's going to play and you're going to do a healing dance. And, but right before she did it, she, she did an altar call. And she called for all the women who were having uh, problems in their, uh, their ovaries, their, their, their uh, you know, or they had had abortions, or that, you know, problems unique to women. And so, <laughs> so here were all these women lined up in front of the altar, and she says, okay, now you're going to do the healing dance. So she called them up from the altar, and they were all on the back of the stage. And here I am on the front of the stage thinking, okay, what are we going to do? And so the music starts. And so I left my mind that was freaked out, and I let the Holy Spirit begin to dance. And the first thing I did was go over to the first woman and put my hand on her. And she fell. She was large. And she fell so, she, she fell like that. She fell so hard, I thought, oh no, she's going to break every bone in her body. And I, I saw out of the corner of my eye the leaders of the meeting, they all jumped up and ran up on the stage. We were all shocked that the power of God was being released. And one after another, I would move and then I would put my hand. And I would move and then I would put my hand. And every woman on the stage fell in the power of the Lord and all the testimonies came for months after that I was completely healed I didn't have to have surgery they said why, why did you come to have surgery it's, there's nothing here over and over and over so wherever we are we let the life of God come before us we let the life of God come out of us we let the, we let the Holy Spirit show us the ways of life 
I had a real experience, a real learning experience <laughs> at that time doing the healing dance that I had no, I thought, it, I, honestly, I thought it was weird. I thought it was just weird. And so you and I, we can't, we can't come in opposition to the movings and the manifestations of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth and he is teaching us how to live. He is teaching us how to release. The, the disciples had to learn how to release the, the power of God, the, 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 the greatness of God, the wonders of God, the signs of God. I can remember when, when I had uh, my first experiences after receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit, my personal Pentecost, I can remember I had to go back home before I, I couldn't speak in tongues in the meeting. It, I was just so freaked out and, and embarrassed and intimidated and, you know, and so I went home and in the dark, in my bedroom alone, my husband was asleep, I said, okay, what has happened to me? And out came this language and the waves of love begin to sweep over me. I'd never experienced anything like it. And I had a loving home, a loving, I grew up being loved, but the waves of love came over me. And the thing that I remember the most was I felt like I had come home. We don't live out in the world with all this craziness going on. We live inside of ourselves in the kingdom of heaven. That is our home. That is the place that is prepared for us. Jesus has prepared that place for us, and it is filled with the Holy Spirit. So after Pentecost comes miracles and glory and a way of life that causes us to be enraptured with his presence. So I pray for you today that you find and know and walk in the ways of life the Holy Spirit, the spirit of joy, the spirit of truth, the spirit that causes you to overcome and to persevere. We will overcome in this hour. You will overcome in this hour. We may not change the, the circumstances immediately, but, but you will overcome, and so will I, because we are overcomers. Read in Revelation about the overcomers and what happens to them. So, Lord, we thank you for this hour. We thank you for this opportunity to learn the ways of life. We praise you and we worship you, O oh God.